Hi, my name is Kevin Hicks and welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now today's video is on the conspiracy to execute Queen Anne Boleyn. So I've been fascinated by this subject, Anne Boleyn, her execution. I'm going to look at this and take you on a little bit of a journey which may help you understand what was going on in the court of King Henry VIII. Now, first of all, when I go for a poop, you know, I do like to be on my own and I like to see to myself, if you understand what I'm saying. Well, actually, I'm not always on my own. I've got a dog. Hmm. Speaks for itself. So let's uh, look at Henry VIII, right? Gets up first thing in the morning, gets up very early. He has somebody come in with the, the pot for him to pee in and uh, that is done as he sits on the edge of the bed. He stands up, he's helped into his uh, dressing gown. Yeah, it's uh, reputed that he had a piece of fur on either side of his chest and back to attract all the, the mites and things that lived in his clothes. Hey, that's another thing. He would then leave his bedchamber into his um, private chamber. And there things went on. His privy council, his closest advisors. But the closest of those uh, had to be a kind of a personal friend, a confidant, and was an extremely powerful man. This is the keeper of the royal stool. Now the royal stool, or the closed stool, was a, an oak box, padded on the outside, had a very nice seat with a hole in it, and a lid. It's where the king went for a poop. So there is his privy councillor around, and the king would simply lower his bottom on the suddenly opened lid, and then his nightshirt would be lifted up and he'd be sitting there pooping away. Now, I do know that Henry VIII suffered from what my grandmother suffered from, constipation. So can you imagine the scene, right? There are these members of the Privy Council, they're there in their finery, first thing in the morning, they've had to get up very early indeed. And there is the keeper of the royal stool standing back, respectable, but whispering maybe, and the king's ear. And the king, with his constipation problems, is sat there going, cross-eyed, I'm trying to do his business of the day. Now, when he's finished, he will simply raise himself up and the keeper of the royal stool will wipe the king's bottom clean. They used a, what was described as a taffeta cloth or, or linen, this is a bit well, you know, did they then retrieve it and clean it? Did they wash it? Hey, that's for another time maybe. But it's what went on with that Privy Council. Who were these people? What were they up to? So, Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry VIII, Queen of England. She has a very close friend and confidant. He is Sir Henry Norris, who happens to be the keeper of the royal stool to Henry VIII. So he has the ear of the king, shall we say, not the rear, the ear. And he also has the ear of the queen. Somebody else has her rear. That's a lady in waiting. Whole different story. So the two of them together, very close. Then Norris with his close circle of friends, men who are in the, the royal wardrobe. Um, such fabulously wealthy people, these. They are very, very strong because if you are the keeper of the royal stool, you're also the keeper of the privy purse, the king's money. You are powerful. Now, this is going fine until you add another name to this. And this is where the whole conspiracy thing kind of goes on. Because the name I'm going to introduce now is Thomas Cromwell. So, Thomas Cromwell, first minister to the king, Henry VIII. Now he, together with Henry VIII, decided to channel some of the money that was being made from the dissolution of the monasteries, whole different subject, into their own pockets and also to foster a relationship with the Holy Roman Empire. Yet again, another subject. However, the Queen, together with the keeper of the royal stool, Henry, wanted the money not for their own use, but for the poor, because now the monasteries were down, there is no arms for the poor. So they thought the best thing they could do, channel some of the money into the poor, and also they were trying to foster a lasting peace and alliance with France. They're going against Thomas Cromwell, and he has a spy network. And he's picked up on an overheard conversation where Anne Boleyn alludes to the king's death. It's illegal! 
you can't even countenance think that the king may die. So Thomas Cromwell, he seizes the day and he takes into custody Mark Smeaton, the Queen's musician. And he is questioned. No, he's not. He tortured him. And you imagine that because that poor wretch confesses that he's had a love affair and has been sleeping with the Queen and the Queen has slept with many others too and she's been conspiring with other men to actually kill the King and Smeaton actually names these other men which actually include the Keeper of the Royal Stool, Sir Henry and the Queen's brother. This is the conspiracy. This is awful because dates are put together, but they don't make sense. Apparently on one liaison, the queen was with this man, but she couldn't have been because she'd just given birth to Princess Elizabeth. It's a setup, it's a conspiracy, and it's gonna go to trial. So the trial of Anne Boleyn and her co-conspirators, they had a jury, it should have been fair, but here's a twist. In those days, you didn't get told what you'd been charged with until the day of the trial. Ha, you couldn't prepare. But notwithstanding that, Anne and her brother George put up a great defense. In fact, some of the jurors had a bit of a gamble. They said it's 10 to one that he'll get off. But no, it's a done deal. The jury knew their duty to the king. So Anne Boleyn, her brother George, and the other conspirators were found guilty of treason. That's George Berlin, Sir Henry Norris, Sir Francis Weston, William Brereton, and the musician, Mark Smeaton. They were gonna die. They'd been found guilty. They should have been hung, drawn, and quartered. But the king showed lenience. <laughs> He's just gonna have their heads cut off. However, Queen Anne, found guilty of treason, she should be burned at the stake. But this is the first execution of a queen. So the king shows leniency. She will be beheaded. So the execution of Anne Boleyn. Uh, the popular myth is that uh, she requested that a swordsman be brought over, the executioner of Calais, to do the deed. But she was found guilty of treason on the 15th of May. And just a few days later, on the 19th of May, she's going to be beheaded, but actually it wasn't meant to be the 19th, it was the 18th, and it was all set up and she's ready to die when Thomas Cromwell orders it to be postponed because there's too many people watching, because they are going to kill a queen, and he didn't want foreign diplomats to witness the dirty deed, so it's cleared out and that poor woman has to wait till the next day. Well, come the next day, she is so composed, it was almost as if her mind was in a higher place. There is a condition for this, but I am not a doctor, so I can't tell you what it is. She walks to her own execution. She is wearing an English hood, you know, the old Tudor hood, black velvet, and a red dress, the symbol of a martyr for her cause. She goes and mounts the scaffold. Apparently she gives a speech, but most importantly, she kneels down and holds herself up. No head on the block and proud, hands clasped, she prays out loud. The swordsman behind her, silent and swift, cuts her head off in one. He then holds it up. God save the king. Well, he probably didn't say that, did he? Because he's French, so he probably went, God save the queen, yeah? But everybody goes, oh, gasp, because the queen's eyes are moving and they fixed on a lady in waiting, and her lips appear to be moving as if she's trying to speak. Now apparently that's not uncommon if you cut somebody's head off. I don't know. But then embarrassment. There's this French guy with a sword and a head, and there's the body. But they'd forgotten to bring a coffin. Can you imagine that? So guards are sent away very quickly into the armory, and they come back with a nice oak chest. It's an empty arrow chest. And the queen's body, together with the head, are placed in the chest and it's fastened down. But she was buried under the floorboards of St. Peter's Chapel, the chapel for the Tower of London. 
and there she would lay for many, many years undisturbed. That is, until they dug her up. But that's for another story, another film. Well, I hope you enjoyed that film, or at the very least, found it interesting. If you did, thumbs up. Now, if you're a subscriber, great. If you're not a subscriber, then subscribe. Ding that bell and join in because we are having a lot of fun with history. Thank you very much for your time. Bye for now.